Big Bao, the American former world heavyweight boxing champion, was technically knocked out by his Russian opponent, Levgen Golovin, in the second round in the Muay Thai Super Fight 2013 event in Pattaya City on June 14th. The event took place on a temporary arena at the Bali High Pier in Pattaya City of Chonburi Province. It was organized to promote Muay Thai boxing and there were bouts for seven Muay Thai championships of the World Professional Muay Thai Federation and WBC Muay Thai, including the heavyweight above 201 pounds. Championships of both institutes contested by Big Daddy Riddick Bao and Levgen Golovin. In the first round, the Russian boxer went on the offensive and noticeably weakened Bao by repeatedly kicking his legs. Bao tried to respond with his fists, but he was too slow. Repeated low kicks at knee joints sent Bao on the floor once, but he survived the round. Bao continued to have the same difficult situation in round two. Low kicks toppled him twice and the bout was terminated. In an interview, Bao admitted Muay Thai was much more dangerous than he had thought. This was his Muay Thai debut and he confessed he had been poorly prepared but he wanted to do the Muay Thai boxing again if he was invited. Lovers of traditional Thai food have been tantalizing their taste buds at a food festival in the capital, Bangkok. Despite heavy rains, crowds of visitors turned out to tuck into some of the city's top culinary specialties. Outside Bangkok's biggest shopping complex, chefs are busy cooking up the best in Thai street food. One is preparing an old favorite, Pad Thai. The well-known rice noodle is wrapped in eggs and stir-fried with a combination of bean sprouts, shrimps, chicken, crushed peanuts and lime juice. Other sellers are serving up deep-fried pork pieces and mixing filtered tea with condensed milk for their eager customers. Some of those selling food here have roots that go back more than a generation. Others have grown from a single food cart into a fully operated restaurant or even a chain. Mai Noi, shop from Dinso Road in the city's historic quarter, is serving an assortment of curries. Owner Nuanjan Jang Nin inherited a street food cart, a restaurant and recipes from her mother who used to work in a kitchen at one of Thailand's royal palaces. Her speciality is masaman curry and green curry with chicken, which she sells at 50 baht per dish. Nuanjan says it's about the herbs and the mix of spices which is concentrated. That's why people like Thai food, especially the foreigners. A stall serving guai jab, a Chinese-style flat rice noodle with boiled eggs, pork and innards, is also doing well. The thick broth is a mix of five spices, soy sauce, celery and cilantro roots. A bowl costs 40 baht. Konka Supraset, who is selling the dish, says his regular food stand near the city's major transportation hub, Victory Monument, sells thousands of bowls of noodles a day. The family business includes several outlets across the city. Supraset says the key is to keep adapting and improving the recipe. The food is not only appealing to Bangkok residents, tourists are also tucking into the Thai treats. The spices they use here, like, we are not used to that uh, in Central America. In America, we are not used to this, so it's very good. I, I didn't really know what I was in. I thought I was going to order some fried chicken. And the guy couldn't speak English, not his problem, mine. Um, so I said, please now some of the chicken. He goes, any of this? And I said, whatever, just put it in a bowl and make it look good. Um, and it ended up being some noodles, some cabbage, a chicken foot, a chicken leg, a chicken liver, chicken and a chicken heart, and some chicken intestines, which was a bit of a shock. And um, I still ate it, though. I dissected a bit of it and took some stuff out, but it was quite not tasty. The broth was nice. The four-day festival organized by the Tourism Authority of Thailand runs until 16th of June. Fishing with trawling nets has destroyed many of the coral reefs off Cambodia's south coast. Now, one man has begun a project aimed at reversing the damage using reef pots anchored into the ocean floor. Sanka village, population 200, is typical of many of the poor villages on the remote islands off Cambodia's south coast. For generations, the people here have earned a modest income from fishing using small boats and nets. In recent years, locals have reported a big fall in the size of their fish catch, resulting in hard times for many families. 
The problem is the fleet of much bigger fishing boats now operating out of the port of Sihanoukville on the mainland two hours away. They use huge weighted trawling nets that drag along the bottom of the ocean floor, scooping up everything in their path. The nets destroy the marine life, including precious coral reefs that are key breeding grounds for many species of fish. In January this year, Canadian Kylie Gavart set up Conservation Cambodia with the aim of regenerating the coral reefs around Koh Rong. Recently, joined by his first volunteer, Matt Moroni from London, England, Gavard builds and deploys cast iron reef pots onto the seabed. The pots are lowered by ropes to the ocean floor. Homemade concrete feet are used to secure the pots to the seabed. Bags of rocks are then tied to the pots to add extra weight. Uh, the destruction to the reefs here is incredible. I mean, you can see uh, where the trawling boats have passed. You can see where dynamite's exploded. And the reefs need to be healthy in order for the fish to, to thrive. And so we're giving them a chance to do that by putting these reef pods in the water. 22 pods have been laid since January with the aim of reaching 100 by the end of the year. These pods deployed just 10 weeks ago are already forming new layers of coral. Fish life has quickly returned to the once denuded seabed. Gavard says the results so far have been very impressive. The success rate we've had so far, the results we've had, have been nothing short of astounding. We're not even propagating coral, we're not transplanting coral, we're letting it happen naturally and we're seeing growth after 10 days, even more after 20 days uh, and even more so now four months down the road since we started this. The pots are a modified version of a design first developed in the Maldives and are made from rods normally used in the local construction industry. The pots are forged and welded on the mainland and finish off by hand in the village. For London volunteer Matt Moroni, the work is rewarding. Last, last week I was at home building houses and here I am out here building reefs in Cambodia. And it's just it's amazing to be part of it and to watch the growth, to watch what it's doing for, for the marine life. For the people. Each pot is constructed from five iron rods, weighs 15 kilos and costs 50 US dollars to construct. They are sanded to remove any rust before a coat of epoxy is applied. Sand is sprinkled on the glue and they are allowed to dry. To protect the new reefs, Gavard is in negotiations with the Cambodian Department of Fisheries to create a protected area around the pots. And local people are also cooperating by avoiding fishing in the area, which augurs well for the future of the effort. My wife is from the island, um, and I live here now in this small fishing village with her and our first son. And uh, after diving for so many years, seeing the destruction, seeing the decline in fish, I thought maybe I could do something about it. So that's what I'm working towards, and I'll continue working towards it to make this as good as possible, to make it as big as possible. Conservation Cambodia's first batch of 35 student volunteers is now on the way ahead of a big push to quickly rebuild the reefs and preserve the local way of life. <music> Filipino inmates who skyrocketed to internet for fame on their dance renditions of Michael Jackson's hits debuted in a film about reforms in a corrupt prison. The inmates of Cebu Provincial Detention and Rehabilitation Centre, whose videos earned 40 million hits on YouTube since 2007, played themselves in the movie Dance of the Steel Bars, which premiered in the Philippines on June 12th. American actor Patrick Bergen played the main character of a retired US fireman wrongfully convicted for killing a man. He makes friends with an embittered fellow convict who discovers the rehabilitating nature of dance. The plot is based on real-life reforms instituted at the Cebu jail, where a security advisor thought of teaching dance to around 1,000 inmates, not only as physical exercise but also to instill discipline and camaraderie. Jails in the Philippines are notorious for overcrowded cells, where gangs are at war and vices like drugs and gambling proliferate. The filmmakers wanted to highlight the transition of Cebu jail, where suspects await verdicts on cases. Aiming for authenticity, co-directors Cesar Apolinaro and Marni Manikat shot the film inside the Cebu detention centre for seven days, with a cast of professional actors and about 750 inmates. It was very emotional for all of us because we saw how they, you know, how they were rehabilitated through dance, through dance, and. Um, I, I think the film will 
show this. Actor Joey Paras, playing a transsexual whose idea it was to teach dance routines to fellow jailbirds, said she was scared of shooting inside a jail at first, but her fears were quickly erased. Within Director Cesar Apolinaro says the inmates showed raw emotions that worked to the film's advantage. The producers from Dubai-based Portfolio Films International are hoping that they can cash in on the YouTube fame of Cebu's dancing inmates, eyeing international releases including the Middle East and the United States. After years in the cutting room, the filmmakers returned to the Cebu jail last June 7th to show the final cut to the inmates. One of the film's highlights is a five-minute dance sequence that seeks to do justice to the real-life inmates' talent. About 200 Buddhist leaders and monks met at a monastery on June 13th in Yangon to discuss ways to end communal conflict between Muslims and Buddhists in Myanmar. Giving speeches and pushing for peace, a group of monks also proposed a new law they would like to implement. The National Buddhist Protection Law will grant individuals the right to change religions only if they choose to do so. Burmese women who marry Muslims men would no longer have to give up Buddhism as required by current laws. Muslim men will be required to only have one wife and the law also proposes controlling the birth rate among Muslim families. No other details of the proposed law were given. Some leaders who attended the meeting said it is too soon to propose such a law without more discussions. For me, is that this statement is that the uh, issue, uh, because a little bit early, actually, in my opinion, supposed to you know, get the vote, okay, these kinds of uh, law is it should be uh, agreeable or not, whatever the comment, uh, the comment, uh, comment uh, whatever the amendment that needed or not then will be the, the, the problem will be less. The meeting comes several weeks after the latest breakout in sectarian violence that killed one man in the northern city of Lashio, a city about 700 kilometers from Yangon. About 1,200 Muslim residents took shelter at a Buddhist monastery after their homes were burned. Authorities said 25 people are under investigation for the violence. Muslims make up about 5% of the estimated 60 million people in Myanmar.